Are you interested in getting a new virtual reality headset? Maybe you're new to the environment and you're not exactly sure what's on the market. Or you're a pro that's been here for a while but isn't exactly sure what's worth the money for their next upgrade. Today's video is going to go over the benefits and the drawbacks of most of the headsets that are on the market right now in an effort to simplify things and make your buying experience a little bit easier. I'm going to be giving each of the headsets a rating from zero to five based on visual quality, audio quality, comfort, ease of use, and last of all, price point. Hopefully this gives you a better idea of the strong points of each headset so that you can understand which one would most likely be the best fit for you. Before I dive into the specs of each one, I wanna go over some commonly used terms that for somebody that's new to the space might sound confusing. The first one is resolution. Basically what the resolution is, is the amount of distinct pixels that can be displayed on a screen in a certain dimension. Let's take a resolution of 1920 by 1080, for example, because this is one of the most common monitor sizes. You would have 1920 pixels horizontally and 1080 pixels vertically. Generally, the higher the resolution, the better the quality image you're going to get. If it is a low resolution, especially in VR, you're going to notice distinct pixels. Now, this is very important for virtual reality HMDs because we're putting these tiny screens really close to our eyes. So if you're working with a lower resolution panel, you're going to notice distinct pixels, which give you a lesser quality image. The second term is field of view. Now this is measured in degrees. And what this means is the extent of the world that we can observe at any given moment. The average human FOV is 210 degrees horizontally. And that includes the peripherals at the end of our vision. The last term I wanna go over is refresh rate. And a lot of you probably already know what this is if you've shopped for a gaming monitor. But what this means is the amount of times in one second that your screen can draw a new image. So if you have a really high refresh rate in a panel, it's going to give you a smoother gameplay experience because it's drawing a lot of pictures per frame. The refresh rate is measured in something called Hertz. So if you have a screen with a rating of 60 Hertz, your screen is drawing a new image 60 times within one second. If you have a low refresh rate panel, it can generally cause a choppy gameplay experience, which is especially bad in VR because that can make something like motion sickness much worse. Now that you know what these terms mean, let's go into the headset specs and go over their advantages and their disadvantages. Now the Oculus Quest 2 is what we call an all-in-one standalone headset. This is essentially its own gaming console. You don't need a PC to run games on the headset. All you have to do is have a Facebook account and a mobile phone to complete the initial setup. Uh, from there, all you have to do is download games or apps to the onboard storage, and you can play games wherever you want. The Quest 2 has LCD panels for the display, and it offers a resolution of 1832 by 1920 per eye. Its field of view is quite low at 89 degrees horizontally, but this is required because the Quest 2 is powered by a mobile phone chip, the Qualcomm Snapdragon XR2, which is very powerful for what it is, but it can't drive those higher field of views that some of the other headsets can. Having a large FOV on a headset can be more taxing on the hardware. The display panels on the Quest 2 can run at 90 hertz, which is pretty good. And it can even push itself to 120 hertz in some games. The Quest 2 utilizes something called inside out tracking, which essentially uses four cameras on the frame of the headset to track the controllers and scan your environment to ensure that you're staying in your play space. You also have the option to use Quest 2's hand tracking to navigate games and apps. This is a feature that some other headsets may support, but you generally need to purchase separate modules like the Leap Motion to get it to work. With the Quest 2, this is completely native and you don't need any separate modules. As far as comfort is concerned, the Quest 2 comes with a pretty standard elastic head strap, which doesn't get many points for comfort. It's, it's not the best. But there are a lot of cheaper options on Amazon or Etsy that you can purchase that drastically improve the comfort of the headset. I use the Bobo VR M2 head strap and it does a really great job of distributing the weight of the headset to make it a lot more comfortable for use. It's only 40 bucks, and with the Quest 2's price point being so low already, it makes it very justifiable for a drastic improvement in comfort. The audio on the Quest 2 isn't the best out there. It has integrated speakers, so it is passable, but it's not going to give you the best possible audio experience. So the visuals are pretty good. 
the audio is not so good, and the comfort is not great. So what makes the Quest 2 such an incredible value for the money? Well, if you've ever tried PC VR, you'll know that there's one main frustration with a lot of the headsets that are out there right now, and that is being tethered to a cable. The Quest 2 is still one of the only products available that is capable of running PC VR games completely wirelessly. It's hard to overstate just how important it is that the Quest 2 has this feature, especially at the super low price point of $300. This feature allows the Quest 2 to become easily the most versatile headset on the market. Now, if you want to play PC VR games, obviously you'll need a PC. For the Quest 2, I'd recommend at least an NVIDIA 60 series card to run things fluidly. If your main interest is in playing PC VR games as well, I would suggest going with the 128 gig model because you won't need as much onboard storage to store games. If you're planning on playing more games that are native to the Quest 2, I would recommend going to the 256 gig model, which is 399. So the Quest 2 doesn't have the best visuals, the best audio, or the best comfort. But what it lacks in these things, it makes up for in versatility. I would say it's absolutely worth the $300 for the 128 gig model, at least to figure out if VR is right for you. Our second headset today is the Valve Index. The Valve Index is a PC VR headset that made huge waves in the industry when it released in June of 2019, along with Valve's flagship VR game, Half-Life Alex, which is still widely known by critics to be the best VR game to date. Because it's not a standalone headset though, you will need a PC to run games on this headset. For visuals, the Index sports a resolution of 1400 by 1600 per eye, with a field of view of about 130 degrees horizontally. This wide FOV is achieved due to the placement of your eyes in the headset. Your eyes will sit closer to the lenses than other HMDs, so it increases your field of vision. The further your eyes are away from the panels, the lower your FOV will be. The LCD panels offer refresh rates of 80 Hz, 90 Hz, 120 Hz, and an experimental 144 Hz mode. The experimental 144 Hz mode offers an incredibly smooth gameplay experience, but it will definitely require higher end hardware to run it consistently. Valve specifically designed the speakers on this headset to offer the best in class audio of any headset on the market. The headphones rest away from your ears, which is good for comfort because you don't have any material resting on your ears to make them hot. The sound is full of body, and having the headphones further away from your ears makes it feel more natural, as if the sounds are happening in your surrounding environment. Having great audio is an excellent benefit for immersion, and Valve knew this. Valve also developed their own tracking solution and their own controllers for this headset. The Lighthouse base stations were developed for use with their Knuckles controllers, but they're also compatible with other controllers, like the Vive Wands. This method of tracking is currently the absolute pinnacle of precision tracking for the consumer market. The Valve Knuckles are an excellent set of controllers that feature a hand strap that go along the back of your hand. This allows you to let go of the controllers without them going anywhere. This might seem like a small feature, but it actually makes actions like throwing things in VR much more natural feeling. The controllers also have pressure sensors on the handle, which can detect how tightly you're squeezing which offers a sort of faux hand tracking solution. It's not quite as precise as hand tracking, but it's pretty close. Between the high frame rate, the relatively high FOV of 130 degrees, the best in class audio of any headset on the market, and the precise tracking of the Lighthouse base stations, it's very clear that Valve thought about the entire package as opposed to just visuals. This is truly a premium VR experience that I believe everybody should have the opportunity to try. And at $1,000, I think it makes a very compelling purchase for a mid-range enthusiast. So the third headset on our list is the Vario Aero. Now before I talk about this one, I wanna go over the lens technology so that you can understand what makes this headset so incredible. Right now, a majority of the lenses on the market are what you call Fresnel lenses. And these are made using a series of concentric rings that kind of make up a lens shape. 
These Fresnel lenses are generally a little bit cheaper, but they cause something called God rays, which are beams of light that are emitted from high contrast environments. The Vario Aero, however, utilizes aspheric lenses, which don't use concentric rings, so God rays are completely gone in the Vario Aero. As opposed to other headsets as well that rely on rendering the image in two separate display panels across both your eyes, the Vario Aero only has one display, and it runs at a resolution of 2880 by 2720. It also has eye tracking and foveated rendering. It can detect where your eyes are looking at on the screen and automatically make those areas more dense in detail whereas the rest of your peripherals will be shown at a lower resolution to ensure high performance. The Vario Aero concentrates its pixel density near the center of the screen where it matters the most. Near the outer portion of the view bounds, you have a slightly smaller pixel density, but it's still quite clear. The field of view is a modest 115 degrees horizontally, and its mini LED displays can run at a refresh rate of 90 Hertz. This is also the brightest display on the market, boasting 150 nits of brightness. The Vario Aero also has an extremely comfortable head strap. It was carefully designed to distribute as much weight away from the face as possible. It's also fairly lightweight. At 487 grams, it's nearly half of the weight of the Valve Index. The Vario Aero supports Steam VR lighthouse tracking, so you can use your knuckles or Vive wands if you have them but it doesn't come with its own controllers, so you will need these things in order to play PC VR games, unless you're only doing something like race sims or flight sims. You would think that you would need an incredibly expensive computer in order to run this HMD to its fullest potential, but that's just not the case, and I believe there's two reasons for this. The first is that the Vario Aero only is powering one display, as opposed to most headsets, which are rendering twice, one for each panel for each eye. The other reason is the foveated rendering that comes natively with the Vario Aero. Focusing the high resolution based on where your eye is looking has a dramatic increase in performance. The Vario Aero unfortunately has no audio solution except for a headphone jack. I'm assuming this is because this headset is meant to cater towards the high-end enthusiast crowd, and usually these folks already have a high quality audio solution ready. If you're looking for the best possible visuals that money can buy and you have $2,000 laying around, the Vario Aero is definitely the right headset for you. Now the next one on our list is gonna be the HP Reverb G2. Now the HP Reverb G2 has been a hugely popular option for race and flight simming communities since its release in November 2020. At a resolution of 2160 by 2160 per LCD panel and a field of view of 114 degrees, this headset at the price point has a better resolution and field of view than most others in this price bracket. The HP Reverb also runs at a refresh rate of 90 Hertz, which is pretty good. The HP Reverb G2 is much lighter than the Valve Index at 550 grams, which tends to lend towards the comfort of the headset. This device also uses inside-out tracking, very similarly to that of the Quest 2. Now, when this device first launched, the controller tracking was not very good. It would lose track of the controllers pretty regularly, and it just didn't have that same consistent quality that the Quest 2's inside-out tracking had. But recently, the HP Reverb G2 got a bit of a refresh, and the controller tracking was one of the main things that was drastically improved. So now, after the refresh, the device pretty much has the same quality of controller tracking as the Quest 2. Now with the HP Reverb G2, you can use the Steam VR Lighthouse base stations as well as the Knuckles controllers or any other controllers that are compatible with those base stations but you will require third-party software in order to get that to work. I'll leave a link in the description for a tutorial on how to do this if you wish to do so. For audio, HP partnered with Valve to give them the same speakers that the Valve Index was so well known for. Therefore, the audio quality is some of the best in the industry with the HP Reverb. Race and flight simming is super fun, but it can be very costly. After you purchase the cockpit, the steering wheel, the flight stick, all that stuff, you're already hundreds of dollars in. This is what makes the HP Reverb G2 such an awesome bargain. For almost a quarter of the price of the Vario Aero, 
you're getting a much clearer display than the Valve Index with the same best-in-class audio. If you're using this for flight or race simming, this is definitely going to be a headset that you want to take a look into. Now the next one we're going to be talking about is the Arpara 5K. And there's two options when you're purchasing this headset. You can either get the all-in-one standalone version or you can get the PC VR only version. The Arpara 5K has an excellent resolution of 2560 by 2560 per eye, and it utilizes micro OLED displays. So what is micro OLED technology? Basically, micro OLED displays consist of arrays of microscopic LEDs forming the individual pixel elements of your display. So compared to widespread LCD technology, which is what a majority of these headsets use, micro OLED displays can completely turn off the individual LEDs that make up its panel. This will offer you better contrast because the LEDs can completely turn off, so you get true blacks out of your display. Whereas the LCD panels have a backlight that's pretty much always on. Micro OLED also has a better response time than LCD panels. There's basically less lag between when the image is drawn in the computer chip in the headset to when it's actually displayed on the panel. And it should improve battery life. As opposed to LCD panels, which are pretty much on the entire time the display is running, the micro OLED display will only be powering the pixel LEDs that need to be on at that given time. So it's more efficient, gives you better clarity, and gives you better contrast. The field of view on the Arpara 5K is slightly higher than the Quest 2 at 95 degrees horizontally. The refresh rate of the tethered VR device from Arpara supports up to 120 Hz, whereas the standalone all-in-one only supports up to 90 Hz. Very similarly to the Quest 2, the Arpara 5K uses integrated audio. It's built into the head strap and it provides decent sound. But if you're looking for a better audio experience, you might want to consider using a nicer pair of headphones with it. Now, looking at the Arpara 5K from a comfort perspective, it's a very slim headset. It's got a really neat profile. Taking away all that unnecessary bulk leaves you with a lighter, easier to wear device. And it's going to make longer play sessions much easier in the Arpara 5K. I'm not sure if the head strap is modular or not, like the Quest 2's is, where you can take off the stock head strap and replace it with something that's custom made. But I'd definitely like to see that be the case. Up until recently, the Arpara 5K was able to be purchased through a campaign on Kickstarter. After deciding which device you wanted to go with, you could pledge to that tier, and it would be shipped to you sometime around March, which is, as of the making of this video, next month. It seems as though the campaign is concluded, and they've started a new campaign on Indiegogo. The premise is the same here. If you go to Arpara's website and click Buy Now, it'll take you straight to this page, and you'll be able to choose which headset you want to go with. Just keep in mind that if you're purchasing the $528 entry-level device, it only supports 3 degrees of motion, so you won't be able to move within your play space. If you upgrade to the device with the 6 degrees of motion module, it'll run you $658, but it will be able to track your position within the play space, so you'll be able to move around. If you'd like to go with the all-in-one, that will run you about $728. With the all-in-one, you won't have to worry about the additional 6 degrees of motion module. With its high-resolution micro OLED display panels and sleek design, the Arpara 5K looks to be a solid competitor going up against the Quest 2. I'd say the improved visual quality is the primary reason for the upgrade, but it comes with a much steeper price of $729 for the all-in-one. Overall, I'd say this is a worthy upgrade from the Quest 2 for those of you who enjoy the Quest 2's versatility, but would like a clearer image. Now for the last HMDs on our lists, we have Pimax's 8KX and the Pimax Artisan. I'm kind of grouping these into one category because they both come from the same manufacturer. Starting off with the visuals, the Pimax 8KX has an incredible resolution of 3840 by 2160. This is per panel, so they combine to a stunning 8K resolution, hence the name. 
It can run at a refresh rate of 114 hertz upscaled, but if you have lesser hardware, it can run at 60 hertz, 75 hertz, or 90 hertz as well. Although, I would strongly recommend that you have a pretty powerful PC to run this thing. The resolution is excellent and the frame rate is quite high, but the selling point of this particular HMD is an incredible 170 degrees horizontal field of view, which is the closest any consumer headset has gotten to the human eye's natural field of view. An FOV this huge is an unbelievable boost to immersion in VR. Unfortunately, when you max out the FOV of the Pimax 8KX, you'll probably experience some distortion near the borders of your vision. However, 150 degrees seems to be the sweet spot for eliminating the distortion while still maintaining the highest FOV available on the market. Now the Pimax 8KX is quite heavy at 997 grams, but the weight is distributed quite well to give you a comfortable fit for longer play sessions. As for the audio solution, the headphones look very similar to the Valve Index and the HP Reverb G2, where they're built into the head strap. However, they rest on your ears as opposed to sitting away from them, so your ears might be prone to heating up and getting uncomfortable while playing. They offer decent audio quality that surpasses the Quest 2 and the Arpara 5K, but they don't quite measure up to the best-in-class audio of the Valve Index or the HP Reverb G2. The Pimax 8KX, just like all the other Pimax headsets, supports Steam VR tracking and utilizes the Steam lighthouses. To get the most out of the Pimax 8KX, you're definitely going to want a very powerful PC. Running two display panels at 4K resolutions with an extremely high FOV is very taxing on your hardware, so I would recommend at least an 80 series card or higher. In short, if you're looking for a high-end HMD, with great clarity and a wide field of view, and granted you don't mind tinkering with the settings between each individual game or app, the Pimax 8KX is definitely the right headset for you. Another really nice thing about purchasing a Pimax headset right now is that you're automatically entered into their trading program for the new headset that they're going to be releasing near the end of 2022. Now the 12K QLED is definitely geared more towards the high-end enthusiast and has a very steep price point of $24.99, but it's going to offer the absolute best visual quality and the best FOV of anything on the market, and you're going to be able to play PC VR games wirelessly, although it will most likely require a separate module to be purchased to be able to do that. If you purchase a Pimax headset before its release in late 2022, you'll be able to trade that in to receive the entire cost put towards the 12K QLED. If you participate in the trade-in program, they also say that you'll receive priority when purchasing the new 12K QLED. Now, sticking within the same family, but going to a drastically lower price point, we have the Pimax Artisan. Its resolution is much lower than the 8KX, and is more in line with what you would find with the Quest 2 at 1700 by 1440 per panel. The Pimax Artisan has an incredibly high field of view of 140 degrees horizontally. Now this isn't quite as high as the Pimax 8KX, but the Artisan still maintains a higher FOV than most other headsets on the market. It can also run at 72 hertz, 90 hertz, or 120 hertz as its refresh rate. The build quality of the Artisan doesn't feel quite as premium as the Valve Index, and it's also missing an audio solution. There's a headphone jack to use your own headphones and an integrated microphone, but it'd be nice to have some sort of integrated audio. The Pimax Artisan costs $509 alone. After you purchase a pair of knuckles and some base stations, you're looking at around $1,100, just a bit higher than the Valve Index. In my personal opinion, I believe the Valve Index is still a better value for the money than the Pimax Artisan, but it depends on how highly you value having a high field of view. Still, it's nice to have another option at a similar price point that offers something slightly different. That's all for today, friends. I hope you found the video informative and it helped you simplify things and made it a bit clearer as to which product would be best for you. If you liked the video, please hit me with a like and subscribe to the channel so that you maintain up to date on the VR news. And if I helped you pick out a headset, please leave it in the comment section below. Have a great one and enjoy your time in VR.